I am with Shannon Harvey today, and we are going to talk about her film, Investigating Mindfulness, and it's called A Year of Living Mindfully. Shannon, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thank so, you also for sharing the film with your community. Um, yeah. Imagine people who have, um, have just watched the film. So um, they're probably bursting with a million questions. And uh, I'm really grateful that you're kind of acting as their voice. <laughs> well, hopefully my mental telepathy skills have remained with me over the years and I can uh, get a few things out to you. So um, as a filmmaker, what, when, when you started out, did you have a really clear vision of what you wanted to do? And how did that change as you got to know more information about mindfulness and its impact on you and, and others? Um, I'm interested in how that the narrative, how you found, how you came to, to that? Yeah, so the kind of inspiration for making this film was that I, I'm a health journalist and I'm really dedicated to bringing um, trustworthy information that is grounded in science to people so that they can use that information to kind of um, navigate through the very murky waters of the wellness industry. And um, following on from my last film, which was called The Connection, and was about the science showing that when it comes to the chronic disease epidemic, we need to really take a mind, body, health, a whole person um, uh, approach to overcoming the chronic disease epidemic. And I wanted to turn my mind now, now to mental health. And what do we know? What can people do in order to protect and nurture and nourish our minds? I was looking for the mental equivalent of a 30 minute jog around the block or the mind's daily serving of fresh fruit and vegetables. What was something that I could do for myself? What was something that I could teach my kids um, to be mentally resilient and well? And what was astonishing to me at the beginning of the project was realizing that there is nothing. There is no evidence-based recommendation for what we can be doing for our own mind on a daily basis. So the closest thing that I came to in my search was mindfulness training. It's got a growing evidence base behind it, although it's still very, very early days. And that is really the beginning of the experiment. When I set out to make to the, this experiment, I had no idea what was gonna happen, but I did know that science was really important, which is why I recruited six Australian scientists to follow me throughout the year to see what, if anything, changed as a result of daily meditation. And I, I really love your analogy there with, you know, the, the daily serving of fruit and veg and that 30 minute run, because that's in our head, we know, you know, we, we pretty much know that basically, when I want to get fit, I want to improve my diet, what do I do? I eat, help, um, I eat fruit and veggies and uh, I get off my bum and I move, that's that. But even having done your year of living mindfully, have you still, have you been able to land on something specific that be, can become a part of the lexicon and the understanding in the community about, okay, <clears throat> I've got to go and do my brain work, my mindfulness work. Do you reckon what, what's something that you would like to push forward or something we can strive to? Is it as simple as sitting down for 20 minutes? What, what is it? What do we have to do and what do we need to talk about to make it as straightforward as the 30 minute run or the eating healthily? That's a really good question. I, to, to be honest, I don't actually think that we have the evidence base yet to be able to prescribe something as general as 30 minutes of cardiovascular um, exercise and you know, your weights training or whatever like we do for exercise. And that's simply because mindfulness research has actually only been around for two decades, whereas research on diet and other things has been around for multiple decades. So it is still very early days. But having said that, we do have some solid takeaways that we know. And I can tell you from my year of living mindfully that I've concluded that actually the key is taking time out intentionally every day to be in solitude. That is free from stimulation from other inputs to just bear witness to what is occurring in, for me, it's my crazy, busy, hectic mind. Um, my husband who made the film with me, Jules, who made a few cameos throughout it, he's actually an adventurer um, by his background. He, he's the sort of person who does crazy things, which I know you do too, Jason. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, he's done sled journeys across Antarctica and found himself stranded in tents for six weeks without, with a broken iPod and, and, and a John Grisham novel that had the last page turned 
how it's worn out. <laughs> so, your own <laughs> so I think that's familiar territory for you. Mm. And for him, um, you know, he's been really involved in this project. And his conclusion about this is that it's about that, um, that solitude and that, um, that taking a, t a moment every single day to just be with what is occurring now, as opposed to what I think many of us do, which is grasp for stimulation, for input. Um, and it's very much become like that for me, um, my practice. I, I do still feel the need to set a time, to set aside time to train. And I do think this is a skill as training. And I aim for 45 minutes a day, which I know sounds like a lot for people in busy schedules. <laughs> Um, but I, it takes me these days, it takes me at least 20 minutes just to let my mind settle. Um, and so the rest, you know, the first 20 minutes is just kind of allowing whatever's arising to occur. And then the rest is when I think that I do the, the actual heavy lifting training, so to speak. Yeah. So I suppose this, you know, for um, people listening to it, so it, it really starts, the basis of like, to understand this is, you've got to create some quiet time for yourself. And it's interesting because we do talk about quiet time for kids, go and have some quiet time, just sit and go on that. And, and it makes such an impact on the kids and we don't even probably realize what it is, but hey, that kid is practicing some mindfulness or they're not practicing or just the fact that they're not stimulated. Um, Cause if, you know, if you're not getting stimulated through yourself, there's other things that's coming at you the whole time. So um, do you reckon that would be a good place to start is just to spend, let's say half an hour, 45 minutes might be a bit tough for people to start, but if is half an hour a worthwhile basis on which to build um, your quiet time and to strengthen your mental health? I, I actually think one minute is worthwhile, um, to be quite frank, especially if you're really overstimulated. Mm. And I've, I have trawled the science to see where we're up to with dose, mm -hmm. you know, the dose question, how much should we be aiming for and what techniques work best and, yeah. We still, we still know very little about what techniques work for yeah. her in what circumstances and what duration. Um, but what I can tell you from what the mindfulness experts are telling me is to just aim for, you know, 10 minutes a day to begin with, and then you can build from there. Although I do, I think one of my favorite things that was said to me by John Kabat-Zinn, who's considered by many people to be the father of mindfulness in the Western world, um, and he said to me, oh, I think you should aim for about 45 minutes a day as a minimum, unless you're really busy and stressed, at which time you should aim for two hours. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I was just, you know, there was an OECD report that came out of the World Economic Forum just recently, and it noted that... Um, their children's sense of security, safety, and normalcy will be challenged like never before um, on the back of, you know, COVID and also, uh, you know, obviously augmenting already existing pressures on our time and, and, and our life. So I was just wondering if um, that's something that you've found and if it's something that, if there is anything specific that we should be doing with children differently from ourselves. And I was just wondering if you had any views on the, the specific nature of children's um, mental health and mindfulness. Yeah, there's some really excellent work that's being done by a lot of really um, well-intentioned people. Um, one of the most interesting um, projects that I think will be one to watch is a seven-year study that's being delivered by the Oxford Mindfulness Centre. I think they're delivering it across 48 different schools in the UK. And it's a really fascinating concept, this study, because they're wanting, they're really interested in seeing if we can actually prevent people from developing depression later in life by teaching them mindfulness training, the skill of being able to regulate their emotions, to decenter from um, really high, highly emotional situations. And if kids get taught that kind of skill in their adolescence, whether or not that could potentially prevent them from going on to develop depression later in life. And why that's so particularly fascinating is that we know that depression is a recurrent problem. So if you get depression once, it's highly likely that you'll develop it again at some other stage in your life. And Willem Kuyken, who's the director of research there at the Oxford Mindfulness Centre, talks about the fact that he, he considers depression to be a one billion person problem. And currently at the moment, 
the way we think about mental health is that we don't actually intervene until people are at the mental equivalent of stage four cancer. Yeah. So we wait until people are already very, very ill before we offer them any kind of solutions. So the idea that we could actually offer kids training and teach them a skill of mindfulness, which is a skill like any other, such as reading, and if we could teach them this at a younger age, the concept behind this particular study is that we might be able to prevent them from becoming unwell in the first place. And I think that's probably one of the most significant studies to watch the outcomes of because that will be a game changer in education. And when's that expected uh, to resolve? And when, when were those findings? It was a seven year project? Are they seven just... year project. I think they're about two years in, so okay. we've got really? a long way to go. Yep. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I, I don't, you know, talk to you about you know, kids and, and, and education. We've got about 30 um, online lessons ranging from, as you said before, you know, just a few minutes, you know, some three minutes through to 45 minutes at all different year levels and they can all be found on our website. But we got a letter from a, um, a teacher at an early learning uh, uh, centre, it might have been the early primary school, and they were saying that it was a, um, a bit of a wild uh, uh, postcode and that kids would uh, come up to school, not dress properly, you know, hungry, clearly hadn't washed for a few days, etc., cetera, and, uh, uh, and lots of yelling and screaming in the car park. So the teacher took on teaching the kids mindfulness and these are preschool kids you know sort of five five six years old and then the kids when they um left the school in the afternoon were really relaxed and it had an amazing calming effect on the parents so what when this teacher wrote to us not only have i calmed down my class the kids are now arriving calm fed dressed not looking like they've been dragged through a fence backwards and the whole community around this school she said it's just gone down two notches the whole community so it just really illustrated to me the importance of it only takes a few minutes and also the ability for it to you know by osmosis go through the community and one sees one and one sees another because we can't always control our feelings but if we have those tools in place and i'd like to you know talk a bit about those sort of tools that we might be able to share with some of our, uh, our listeners today some of our uh, our cool teachers about some of those tools that we can um, get in place that aren't that difficult but it's just as you say it's that calming down and taking time yeah i think um I, I need to be careful here because I'm a journalist and not a mindfulness teacher. And I'm certainly not a mindfulness teacher who has expertise in teaching kids mindfulness. Um, yeah. But one of the things that I fully intend to do um, going forward, like I, I'm, I'm really interested in the resources that you're providing because I think that'll be super useful for me as a parent um, to know how parents can use this. Um, so I am going to look into this more. I think it's certainly quite possibly worthy of a follow-up documentary, actually, Mindfulness for Kids um, and Education and How Does That Work. But having said that, there is one thing that I'm doing with my kids um, that might be worth sharing with your viewers, is that I am actually teaching my kids how to be discomfortable. And that's a word that viewers would have seen when they watched the film, the word that I made up <laughs> part way through the project, which is that... I mean, comfort in one's discomfort, right? That's right. Comfort mm -hmm. in my own discomfort. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's kind of controversial because if you've read, you know, the titles of any best-selling mindfulness book, you know, it's all about becoming happier, right? You know, how daily meditation can make you the happiest person in the world or, you know, unlock the keys to peace and everlasting joy. And I really understand why that's an effective marketing tool because everybody wants to be happier. But actually, I think that my training is teaching me how to be, how, how to suffer, the how of being in an unpleasant situation. So a little example of this is that my, um, my seven-year-old son now was having his birthday and my three-year-old son was having a lot of difficulty processing the fact that his older brother was getting all these presents. Mm -hmm. and, and, and my temptation as a parent is to kind of soothe him and make him feel better or maybe find an extra present for him or something like that and take away his anguish. But instead, I just took him aside and just sat with him and was like, yeah, it's really difficult right now that you're not getting any presents and your big brother is. It's really sucky, isn't it? And just 
taught him how to integrate that and process that. And what was really interesting is allowing him to feel unpleasant feelings, yeah. allowing the space for that. He then was able to integrate it himself and he then transformed into a giving spirit. And he was like, well, you know, if I can't get presents, I may as well give presents. And then he went and got a present to give to his big brother. It was really beautiful. So um, there's one little tip that I can pass on as somebody who's not a mindfulness teacher, but as somebody who is a parent. <laughs> oh, dear. So tell me, um, uh, in this field, which is quite newish, you said only a couple of decades of research compared to other stuff that might have been going on for, you know, 100 plus years, um, is, is, the, the, is, it, is it considered real, real science now? By that I mean, you know, that it certainly has taken a long time and it's been viewed sort of negatively and not something that's been understood and not necessarily embraced and thought of and it only until, wow, I think probably in, it's only in the last five years that we've stopped ostracizing people for their um, mental health issues on oh, so and so's had a breakdown you know they've not been well um but you know i think it's it's just sort of coming with us i was wondering if in the making of the documentary you got a view of the type of people that are working in these areas um are there still a few are there a few cowboys around spreading misinformation how do we get to the nub of the of the science which is so important oh i love that question thank you for asking it it's, oh you're welcome it's, it's, <laughs> Such, it's a topic that's really dear to my heart yeah. um, and it's because I value the science so much but it's quite difficult because mindfulness is now a 1.1 billion dollar industry yeah. and um, when I was putting the finishing touches on the book in Australia 1.1 billion globally globally that yeah. seems light that that yeah. doesn't I think, uh, actually I was fact checking it for um, a journalist yeah. who's writing a piece for um, for the uh, Sydney Morning Herald and the Age, and I, I it's 1.2 billion, I think, in this year is it's kind of creeping up. Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> um, you know, I think the app industry alone yeah. is 100 million, so it's it's big business mindfulness these days. And when I was putting the finishing touches on the book that is going to accompany the film, um. I, I came across all these ridiculous products, like, you know, the mindfulness space-saving wine rack. Tony, how can we work mindfulness into this <laughs> one? It's all the rage, quick, mindfulness. It's just looks good. Well, another one was the uh, mindful pets tear strainer for dogs. <laughs> A tear strainer for yeah, God. yeah. Um, do you bottle it or drink it or put exactly. it in size with it or something. And and the books that are written on mindfulness, you know, I think my book when it comes out will be the one hundred thousand and one, you know, book that's ever been written on mindfulness. So nice to be kind of contributing. But the, you know, the subject matter is absurd. Like it goes from everything from mindfulness, you know, for babies, mindfulness for mothers, mindfulness for divorce, <laughs> mindfulness for lawyers. <laughs> you know. um, Catalogue of self-help books and just put mindfulness on the cover and reprint them. <laughs> I know, and I think the authors of these books, including me, are very, very well intentioned. Yeah. Um, so I think that we're all coming from a good space, but I think one thing that came through really clearly with all the scientists that I interviewed is that the public appetite has definitely outpaced the evidence that we've got. And I think the one thing I would say to people who are really interested in um, following a mindfulness exploration for themselves is to pay very close attention to the teachers to pay very very close attention to the quality of the resources that are being produced and to see who's producing those resources yeah. um, and to make sure first and foremost that the training that you're doing actually is the right fit for you so you know you might have a teacher who and I'm, th I'm talking about this in terms of mindfulness for adults people who might be wanting to go very deeply into this mm -hmm. but just to make sure that the teacher um, that you're learning from actually has the same goals as you do that you're both trying to get to the same place because when there's a mismatch I think that there's a possibility for things to go very badly wrong yeah, I think that's a really good point to make that, um, you know, you ascertain where you want to end up together and it's a shared thing that you, you embark on, um, you know, that, you, that you both know where you're trying to get to. I think it's important. I think a lot of people would overlook that and I think it's something that I certainly wouldn't have uh, thought of or checked up on at the start. So, um, yeah, I like that. I like that. 
Um, so you teach mindfulness to your kids. And if you do have in the teaching of mindfulness to your kids and taking those moments, you know, whether it was your fellow getting crook about not getting the presence, have you noticed them um, teaching that to others? Or have you noticed other instances of them incorporating into their lives without you having to sort of tell them at the time? Have you seen instances where you're going, aha, nice one? I think, look, I think you would probably be um, more qualified to talk about this than me because you're the one who's getting the feedback about the impact that you're seeing in classrooms. Um, I, I'm just seeing it in my own little family and I know certainly that when I'm um, more centred, when I'm more available, when I'm more in control of where my attention is mm -hmm. um, through my mindfulness training, that's when I think that I bring my full presence to my parenting. And that, I mean, of course that has knock on effects with my kids. Bigger than we think. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm sure you probably would have many, many, many teachers who can attest to the, the impact of the presence of the teachers in the classrooms and the impact that that would have. Yeah. yeah. And I just wonder if you could just succinctly explain to people, because it is a bit of a catchphrase and a cover all, what is it? Like, how does one be mindful, please? Oh, that's another great question. This is, a, oh, thank you for asking this one as well. It took me a full year before I finally arrived at my own definition of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, the famous definition of what mindfulness um, comes from John Kabat-Zinn and it's ar around the idea of the awareness that arises by paying attention on purpose, non-judgmentally, mm -hmm. or in a particular way, non-judgmentally. Now, if you're not a meditator or a mindfulness practitioner, you just be like, huh? Well, uh, what does that mean? But it is simply, for me, this is where I've landed with it. It is simply the skill of learning to hear myself think. Mm -hmm. And I use the word hear very, very intentionally because I mean it as in hearing instead of listening in order to say something in response, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. The, the ability to sit back with a kind of um, a, an objective standpoint. Another way I like to think of it um, is though, and this one comes from um, Dan Harris, who's featured in the film. He thinks of mindfulness as imagining your thoughts are a rushing waterfall and you're sitting behind the waterfall washing, watching the thoughts rush past. And another really great analogy is, um, this comes from Tim Ferriss, who's the startup entrepreneur. Uh, who says some things that I don't always agree with, but this one he nailed, which is that he thinks that mindfulness is like imagining your thoughts are inside a washing machine, all being churned around, and you're outside of the washing machine, looking in through the glass. And this standpoint, this kind of, this removed standpoint, what um, the scientists are starting to call the skill of decentering. Um, instead of being caught up in your thoughts and experiences, that's simply what it is. Um, and then what flows from that, of course, is so much insight about the nature of, of things um, that has all sorts of implications in the real world. Yeah. So how do we, how does one, Shannon, convince someone? I, I never, I, I've stopped trying to convince anybody. <laughs> <laughs> is it a, is it a, is it a give it a go, try it thing, or you just look, if you're not interested, forget about it. I'm not gonna, I'll just talk to those that have got an interest. Yeah, I think truly people don't start a daily mindfulness practice unless they are suffering in some way yeah. mm -hmm. and they're looking for solutions. Um, or unless perhaps maybe, I think for some of your teachers who are teaching kids, it's kind of yeah. just embedded in their education. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I have family members, you know, I've been meditating now for 1,003 days in a row and I've, my family members say to me, like, you're so different, like, you're so, like, what's happening to you? And, like, you know, my family members can see the benefits of mindfulness in my daily life, but they don't meditate. They haven't been, you know, 
changed. So I'm not trying to convince anybody. I think uh, um... <laughs> because you know to your point earlier about we often uh, you likened it when we get intervention in people who've got mental health issues or uh, balance, and when the equivalent of stage four cancer, when it's clear to everyone that they're off, right? Uh, so I was wondering how. Do you have any thoughts about how one would introduce someone to mindfulness when they didn't or others didn't think they had an issue, but to somehow uh, make them aware that it may be something that could be good for them? Oh, God, this is such a hard question because, you know, really what you're asking is how do you motivate the unmotivated? Yeah. How do you, how do you get people to change their behaviour? And I think ultimately... Here's, here, let me talk about it from my perspective. The truth, the honest truth is that if at the beginning of this experiment, if I did not have a team of scientists who were tracking my every move to see what would happen if I meditated every day for a year, mm-hmm. in the first 30 days, I would not have stuck with it. Right. I would not have continued. And the reason why is because Firstly, I was finding it monumentally unpleasant and quite frankly, I would much rather watch Netflix than sit down with my uncomfortable thoughts and feelings. Doesn't um, watching Netflix count as mindfulness? Unfortunately not. I, okay. I know. <laughs> what about when you first wake up in bed in the morning and you're sort of half asleep? Is that close? No, it could be. And this is something that might interest you. Um, I'm because, feeling more mindful already. Well... You know, because you, I know, having read your bio, I know a little bit about your own background in adventuring and you would probably know the experience of being out in a remote place and how um, you become very present. Like the world around, you just become extremely aware of what is happening instead of being caught up in thinking, thinking, thinking and worrying, 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 planning, 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 meaning making and all of that. Yeah. And that experience that I know you would be familiar with, that is mindfulness. Yeah. And so you could be, I had a, a conversation with Gary Maddox, who's um, a writer with the Sydney Morning Herald, and he's just recently been through a horrendous cancer experience, um, stage four melanoma. And he, every single day, has been training in a pool and he wanted to know, is that mindfulness? Mm-hmm. And the truth is that could be mindfulness in motion. If, yeah. he is, if he is paying in, in attention to what he is experiencing in that moment, the feel of the pull on his body, um, even he could even be paying attention to the thoughts in his mind as long as he's not being caught up in that experience. So, yeah. so, so one could have their own interpretive, that's a starting point, you know, who might not be interested, uh, of being mindful whilst pursuing an activity that was fairly um, focused and repetitive, and that action of that thing can be part, can be a part of that uh, process of your of your mind and getting hold of that and understanding what's going on. Mm. Yeah, good. my meditation teacher calls it your object of awareness. Uh-huh. It's really helpful for me because. Um, your object of awareness could be absolutely anything. So often teachers use, you know, the feel of your nostrils, at the, the feel of your breath at your nostrils. And the, the, it's just simply the skill of noticing when you're distracted and coming back to that sensation. But anything could be your object of awareness. So it could be if you were skiing, it could be, you know, the swish of the ski, you know, mm-hmm. moving. Or if you were swimming, it could be your arm movements or... Um, you know, it could be if you were a builder, <laughs> it could be, you know, just paying attention to the, the sound of the nail and the hammer. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. I think that can be, you know, a useful tip for uh, <coughs> for people who, you know, might have the half hour or you know, I don't know if it's for me, but maybe, you know, it's, uh, it might happen to you. What's your marking exam papers, teachers? Uh, it, could, <laughs> <laughs> it could happen anywhere where you sort of, you know, job, but... Um, no, it's great. And, and something that um, also struck me from um, uh, your documentary, My Year of Living Mindfully, is the, but by 2030, depression and all the issues associated with that is going to overtake heart disease by 2030 as the leading, um, well, it was a cause of death or drama or cost or, anyway, it's going to pass heart disease. I can't remember what the exact ranking was, but can you 
talk a bit further about that and also in your investigations I'm guessing how underprepared we are for this coming tsunami. I know when you think about you know here we are just starting to emerge out of lockdown here in Australia mm. and when I began making the film uh, we were already tracking in all the wrong directions for mental health issues. Uh, the Lancet came out um, with a report right when I began the project saying that every country in the world is facing and failing to tackle a host of mental health concerns. And here we are now in a post-COVID-19 world and, and, and the mental health challenges are only going to increase. I think when we emerge from this and we start looking at what the true cost of this crisis is. Um, it's not only gonna be measured by economics and by the number of businesses that have failed. It's also gonna be measured by the things like um, the number of increased suicides or probably more relevant for teachers, the number of kids who emerge out of this lockdown with gaming addictions mm -hmm. right? because they've been stuck at home on their computers um, unsupervised all day long. Um, so, so I think that there's going to be some serious mental health issues that new mental, mental health issues that emerge. And I think the one thing that I would say to that is it's all very well for governments to put, I think it was $48.1 million towards mental health services, but we need to start having conversations about prevention and we need to start training kids now about how to deal with their difficult thoughts and feelings and how to, um, about the nature of their own minds. Because I think if we can teach it as a skill at the beginning, um, as Willem Kuyken's research is investigating, I think that we may see that we have lots of consequences um, for the future. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So is there anyone uh, or any countries, no, sort of remotely prepared for early identification, for the prevention? Is there anyone that we can look to and say, hey, those guys have got a good handle on this? Do you know when you look at over, in over half the countries of the world, the ratio of psychiatrists to population is one to 100,000. Wow. And you think that psychiatry and psychology is the um, kind of considered the, um, the gold standard, I suppose, of mental health care. Yep. I did the math. I'd have to go back and have a look at my back of the envelope maths. But when I did the numbers, because I thought about this at the beginning of the project, you know, if I was to call a psychologist and say, hi, I'm a mum. We've, we've got a history of mental illness in our family and I'd like to book my kids in for some preventative psychology, please. <laughs> like the psychologist would look at me and say, well, are they experiencing any trauma yeah. at the moment? What are the how, is it, how is that being displayed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when I thought about it from that perspective, I, you know, the idea that we would all see psychologists in order you know, to kind of, you know, prevent mental health issues is absolutely absurd. I think when I did the maths, you know, if every psychologist worked around the clock in Australia, we would all be able to see a psychologist once every six months, which is just not going to cut the mustard, you know, in terms of where we need to go with mental health. So I think that um, basically my conclusion is we need significant investment in mental health research and we need trained people. We need, we need our teachers need resources, basically, yeah. um, because really it starts with them and... Um, and I hope that that's what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Well, it's certainly important to get it right. And I know we've certainly employed a couple of uh, psychologists over the journey who have consulted on the 30 odd lessons that we've got that relate to, uh, to mindfulness. And uh, it's, um, yeah, it's because I think because it's also such a, uh, well, I say fraught with danger because if you get something wrong or you're perceived to have got something wrong, I feel as though there's an extra burden of, guilt or accusation or you know you've somehow mucked it up um did you come across those feelings or did you talk to any psychologist about that that um along your journey that sort of stood out for you 
Yeah, so there's a really interesting discussion that's being led by a um, researcher named Willoughby Britton out of Brown University, who is publishing data about what are some of the adverse events that might occur as a result of mindfulness training. Yeah. And her work is so important, in my view. Controversial, there are a lot of mindfulness teachers who think that um, she's overblowing it, she's, you know... Um, uh, hindering the progress of, mind, of the dissemination of mindfulness. And I do understand why they see it from that perspective. But I also think that Willoughby's voice is a very important one in this, in this in, if we want to progress the field, because I think the idea of uh, mental health first aid, you know, yeah. the idea that we can identify people who are in distress and, and, and know where to send them, know where to send them if they're actually struggling, um, is so, so so crucial for the discussion going forward and for progress and i think i think what you just said there which is like you know we we have we've, we've brought in psychologists in developing our resources yeah. you know that is step one you know that's so important and then the fact that you're open to amending and changing and updating and as as the information comes to hand um that is just so extraordinary and really, really, really important. Well, good. Thank you. Well, you know, we, we, it's, it's important. Thing. And, you know, I've, I don't know if you had said to me 10 years when we're starting, you know, you, you're going to have uh, uh, lessons about uh, wellness <laughs> and well-being. And, and, and I went, oh, really, would we? Um, but it's, it's, so, uh, it's so important because I think, um, well, I think like a lot of things, but mental health, everyone knows someone. Everyone's had an experience, you know, and, and everyone's usually had a, a pretty, you know, full on, but when it goes wrong, it really goes wrong. And, uh, you know, I've been and visited people in psych wards many times and, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a pretty place when, when things, you know, do derail and it's a hard thing to come back from. And there's a lot of, you know, suicide. I've lost several friends. I'm sure, you know, as we all have, but you know, it's something that has really touched us all. To me, it's beyond, a bad, heart, a bad heart it's beyond the road toll it's beyond the drinking problem because it's so random it can hit anyone really at, at any time yes there are some triggers but largely it's you know you get hit with a, a you know a random dart and i'm just um uh you know that that closest i know so i'm i'm a little bit perplexed because it's so close because it's so relevant because it's so relatable for so many people yet We've, um, we still seem to be largely sitting on our hands in addressing the causatal uh, and we're sort of focused on the cure when it's often very late in the game. It's, I've really changed my thinking a lot on this and I, our future, the next project, can you believe it? We're already thinking about the next project. Yes, we are. Good. <laughs> I'm like a woman on a mission. <laughs> our next project um, is about behaviour change and about how do we make lasting changes in our lives and obviously that relates to health but it also relates to mental health issues and think problems like addiction and i've really changed my thinking around this i i you know like you like so many other people um addiction and mental health issues has touched my life as well and mm. as a teenager i used to i used to look at people who are unwell and think why can't you just be different you know step out of it <laughs> out of it. Can't you see how you're hurting everybody around you? Just, you know, get, get it all together. Mm. And now I've really changed. And I see that these issues are actually learning disorders. I, I, um, these, they, they're actually just on a spectrum of behavioural. You know, we all have bad habits. And addiction um, is actually the extreme end of, of, of a habit loop. So I think... The work of Dr. Judson Brewer is going to be one to really follow closely. He's an addiction psychiatrist at Brown University. Who's, he, he was featured in the film. He's the one who's getting five times the quit rate. Um, okay, right, yeah. Mindfulness with quitting smoking. But he's also got an Eat Right Now program, which he's experimenting by delivering in an app and an unwinding anxiety program and, and seeing if, if by teaching people mindfulness they can actually unhook the craving and the reward, that learning system that I was talking about that goes so badly wrong in, in everything from addiction to, to, uh, to anxiety disorders. So he's still got a lot of work to do, but it's certainly a space to watch. Um, and I think for all of us who are touched by these issues, 
I would end on the, on this note by saying that there's a lot of hope, um, and and I think if we can help people learn and understand how their minds work, that may actually end up being the key. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But again, still so much we uh, we don't know, right? Mm. Interesting. So, are you still meditating daily? Daily, yes. Yeah. 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 More Isn't than a thousand good? days now. Without everyone watching you, it's still good. <laughs> and it's bloody hard to do it. I've got to say, still all these yeah. time, all these years, all these days later. Yeah. I find that fascinating. So it's still hard, but it's clearly rewarding for you, and it's it's, it's a worthwhile pursuit. But it's still. Well, I suppose it's still a pain in the ass to get up and go for a run for half an hour in the morning, isn't it? <laughs> but you exactly. drag yourself out and do it. Exactly, because you know in yourself that when you're not running, you don't feel as good, right? So yeah. the motivation for me has changed from being this kind of like extrinsic motivational force, which is all the scientists who are making yeah. me get to it. And now it's become very much intrinsic. It's like, I just, I know that my thinking is significantly clearer if I'm putting aside that time every day to just let the thoughts that need to be thought get thought and, and not kind of muddy up my mind. Yeah. That's it. I've got a, a mate who sort of, uh, I, I spoke to him the other day and I asked him, I said, do you run and stay fit to drink beer or do you drink <laughs> beer to make yourself run? I said, what, what leads what on that chart? I said, can you do me a favour? Can you graph for me for one week, kilometres run each day and cans drunk each day? <laughs> He's done it. He said, it's, I'm, about a, I'm about a can and a half a K. <laughs> <laughs> so whilst it's on mindfulness, it's sort of, I just thought that relationship with the action was sort of, whilst it's not quite your city down for an hour, um, <laughs> said, yeah, I'm about one and a half cans of chaos. Yeah. So you're running a lot then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is why I'm so interested in the behaviour change film is really getting into the science of what makes us motivated to change. Um, There's and how of these funny little things in our heads like, oh, I've done this, now I can do this, now I've done that, oh, I can't do that yet, I need to do a bit more of this. Ah, oh, back I'm just going to do it now. So, yeah, it is it's fascinating how the uh, mind works and how we can convince ourselves of things that we know just aren't right as well. I'm, st I'm fascinated with that as well. So I'd be uh, intrigued if there was uh, some elements of that in uh, your next film. Mm. So, Shannon... Anything else? I feel like we've had a, um, a good cover off there. Have I left anything out that you'd like to uh, do a walk up, start on and hit out of the park? Only just to say that um, thank you to the, for the cool Australia resources in this time. Um, as, a, as a mother who's been homeschooling a, a, a couple of kids, um, tell you what, thank goodness that you guys are producing some high quality stuff for people to get our hands on and, and you know, Australian, that you're an Australian company delivering Australian resources. Um, it's, it's really important work that you're doing. And I know that the teachers who are using the resources and the parents now too, I imagine, um, are very, very grateful. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's fun to do something that you know is, you know, impactful and, you know, literally turning the dial every day. So it's, uh, yeah, thank you. And, you know, all power to you and uh, your year of living mindfully. Thank you. Thanks for talking to us, Shannon. Shannon Harvey with her new documentary, My Year of Living Mindfully.